to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hi, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of To The Point. Today's show focuses on a very important subject, the Congress itself, more specifically congressional dysfunction. So to discuss this important topic, who, other, who else are we going to have? We have with us Dr. Norm Ornstein, one of my favorites for the 22 years I've been here, a longtime resident scholar, um, everything tank you can imagine, and right now the American Enterprise Institute. Norm is one of America's leading experts on U.S. politics the electoral system, the Congress. He's written a number of books, including most recently, One Nation After Trump. And it's even worse than it looks. Fantastic title, fantastic book. Norm is the guy any reporter or academic or even senator calls up when they have a question. We're going to discuss Norm's ideas for fixing Congress, as well as a recent essay that I wrote uh, in the Washington Post, they asked me to write that uh, concerning congressional dysfunction. Norm, welcome. And Great thank you here. for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. You know, I was thinking this morning, and, and people will see this various times over the next few weeks or so. We were, coming, we were, we were at the funeral of John, uh, Congressman, former Congressman John Dengel. And uh, Mr. Dengel, not only was an icon, he represented the Congress, he represented the institution. He had a respect for the institution. And Norm, that's what you're all about. Uh, you know, I had a very close relationship with Dingle over decades. Um, it started out in some ways a little rocky. I had uh, been part of a group that had recommended changing some of the committee structure and jurisdictions, right. including taking some things away from uh, his committee. <laughs> which he did not view uh, with a, a great uh, a pleasure. So I got called uh, to the carpet, and actually I had to sit with my writing friend and uh, uh, partner in all of this, Tom Mann, across from John Dingle, Dan Rostenkowski, and Jack Brooks. Oh, boy. Uh, the three most powerful people in Congress, none of whom were happy. But you came out uh, good. We came out fine, and, of course, they won. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, that started a, a friendship with Dingle that was built in part on our mutual respect for the institution. What does that mean? What does that mean? I use the term too, but what does it mean to you, the respect for the institution? So uh, to me, it has multiple components. A part of it is a recognition that Congress is the first branch of government. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I used to take my students to the Article National Archives. Article 1. Yes, Article 1. I take my students to the National Archives to see the Constitution in its original form, because when you look at it, you realize they have uh, one page, then they have another yeah. page. Article one is twice as long uh -huh. as Article two, which is twice as long as Article three. Right. Why? Because the framers knew that they needed to be more specific about the powers and the duties of Congress, which represented I the carry people with of the me United all the States. Time. And with, with good reason. So that's part of it. A second part of it is res respecting not just the role of the institution, which means, of course, that you are the check and balance against other institutions and the protector of Americans against pernicious What does that checks and elsewhere. balance mean to you? So it means that whether the president of the United States is a member of your party or the other party, you hold that not just that person, but the executive branch and all the people who work in it who are supposed to faithfully execute the laws of the United States, you hold them to account. You make sure through oversight and investigations that they are doing things on the straight and narrow path. And Either the Constitution as a whole means something or it doesn't. And one of the things that I respected so much about John Dingell was when he was chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations in the Commerce Committee, which is an right. enormously powerful uh, subcommittee, chairman of the full committee, ranking member of the committee, or whatever role he had, it didn't matter to him 
that a president was a Democrat or a Republican. If bad things were occurring under their watch, you were going to hold them accountable and do what was right for the public. It's interesting because the Ethics Committee within the House of Representatives yep. is supposed to operate that way, and it usually does. You have Democrats on it, you have Republicans on it, irregardless of what the party affiliation is. You're re-examining in confidence a particular act that any congressman, member of the House, member of the Senate, doesn't matter, uh, did, experienced, and to judge whether it's acceptable or not acceptable. Well, why doesn't the whole Congress work that way? It doesn't always. And the fact is, for the past two years, before uh, 2019, it didn't. It didn't work that way, whether it came to judging its own members. You know, when I look at some of the disastrous things that happen, you get a guy like Blake Farenthold of Texas wow. who, you know, pays out uh, a huge sum of money, of taxpayer dollars, uh, to basically uh, cover up a terrible act of miscreants. And then they drag the feet in the Ethics Committee until he leaves. Right. They force him at least to agree that he'll pay back the money, and then he doesn't pay back the money. Back so the money. we have problems on that front, but the bigger set of problems, no oversight, no investigations. We know that we have a cabinet filled with people who are corrupt and who have done corrupt deeds. We had 15 or so separate investigations of Scott Pruitt going on when he was uh, the uh, head of the Environmental Protection Agency and not any hearings in Congress about what was going on. Well, w w Republicans on th in this case, in, yeah. that, in this case, have absolutely abdicated their responsibility, have they not? If you are an institutionalist, you have a fiduciary responsibility to check these things out and to put some checks and balances in yeah. place. An even better example, uh, or two examples, one is the child separation policy. Uh, and it is a policy. And Kristen Nielsen, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, lied to Congress. Yeah. I don't use the word lightly. Right. Lied to Congress more than once, saying there is no policy. Right. And then uh, I'm on the board of an organization called the Project on Government Oversight, or POGO. POGO uncovers the documents that she signed that say the policy uh, for child separation. Right. You let horrible things like that happen and do no oversight, that's an abdication of, in a huge measure. Then you look at the response to the hurricane in Puerto Rico, which oh. continues to be shameful and disgraceful. Nothing done. Yeah. Nothing done about a uh, FEMA administrator who's now resigning just before, resigned, yes. before uh, yes. bad things happen to him. Well, we know where we are. Yeah. And I mean, unless you put the blinders on, you know where we are. How did we get here, Norm? I mean, uh, because I wrote an article, uh, yeah. and I think you saw it, oh, Washington I did, sure. Post. I hope it was it's valuable to some people. And it resonated. They asked me to write the yeah. article. And it resonated. And in 1995, 94, 95, when Newt Gingrich comes into yeah. control, he sapped a lot of this oversight. He attacked the GAO. He attacked the uh, General Research uh, Yeah, the Congressional services. Research Service. He attacked just about any agency that helps yeah. House members and Senate members get to the truth. Why? And he eliminated the Office of Technology Assessment. Which Nancy's trying to get back and, and, and Speaker and, Pelosi. And it was a very deliberate attempt to make sure that facts and science, and science were kept out of the dialogue. It was the beginning of the war on science. But what Newt did, and it goes back to when he first came Under to Congress. Under the guise of saving money. Yeah, of course, and it was nonsense. <laughs> In 1978, he gets elected to Congress, and he had a strategy over, took him 16 years, of destroying the institution, as he would put it, in order to save it, but he destroyed it in a way that it has not yet recovered from. Amazing. And it was creating a sense in the country as a whole that things are so bad and so corrupt in Congress and in Washington that if we throw all the ins out and bring the outs in, how could it be worse? That attitude, by the way, uh, had a lot to do with Donald Trump getting elected in 2016. How could it be worse? It turned out to be a lot worse. What came out of these these agencies? Yeah. The Watergate report, uh, the Iran Iran Contra 
situation. Reports on all of these things. I could think of at least a half a dozen of them off the top of my head. We don't see that anymore. The staffs are not up to yeah. par. Because if I, I recommend it, which I do, say, yeah. well, you're trying to spend more money for the government. What is the government? Have? If we don't have facts, how are we going to make decisions? And so who makes them for us? Who makes the decisions yeah. for us, Norm? The executive branch. And this is, you know, fortunately, uh, I was around when the uh, Budget and Impoundment Control Act was put in place in the aftermath of not just Watergate and what Nixon did on that front, right. but he was basically uh, taking money that he wasn't supposed to take in the budget and using it for purposes that were not appropriated. He was withholding money unlawfully that had been appropriated. And Congress didn't have the resources right. to be able to even cope with the president's manpower and power over the budget. So they created the Congressional Budget Office. If you don't have the expertise and the first branch of government is supposed to have more expertise and needs it, you're going to be at an enormous disadvantage. And not just when it comes to the executive branch, when it comes to the lobbyists and the other interests uh -huh. around who can bring their own facts to the table that can't be challenged so easily. They're not by nature evil people, lobbyists. I have a great no. respect for lobbyists. Never had any problem with Part lobbyists. Part of the First Amendment, the, the right the, to petition. That's correct. And they have every right to do. But if that's who we're depending for all our knowledge in order to represent our people in our district, in order to be a good member of the House, a good member of the Senate, and yet we're relying on information that's no longer there for us, you don't even have enough people to look at it, then what, what are we asking for here? We, have, we are the problem. Yeah. I can't blame the President of the United States or the executive branch of government or the members of that executive branch for reducing my power. I've allowed it to happen. While this is an erosion over a very long period of time, uh, the fact is that it accelerated dramatically in the last two years. That I haven't seen anything quite like this with a total abdication of responsibility. None of us have. When we had a Republican Congress and George W. Bush was president, you still got some oversight yes. done. You had people like Tom Davis of Virginia, Virginia. a strong Republican. Always stood up. Worked with Henry Waxman yep. uh, when he saw that something was wrong. We also had a party, the Republican Party, that even if it uh, had ideas that you might not agree with uh, or I might not agree with, wanted to solve problems for the country. Now I think that's eroded tremendously. Right. And it's, w uh, what's happened is the lack of interest in or respect for the institution itself for the way it operates, for its rules, for its laws, for its norms, uh, it goes hand in hand with a contempt uh, for uh, the rule of law and for solving problems. It all becomes about holding power. How are we doing as Democrats in, 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 a, in a very bipartisan way, which I know you are objective, yeah. I'm asking that question. How are we doing in, 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 look, in approaching what our responsibility should be under oversight? When you move from the minority to the majority, you are going to get more staff. And some of the staff who've come in have been there before and are experienced. But ramping up, including getting experienced investigative staff, is not an easy thing to do. Right. And then it takes a while to integrate them into the process. On the subject of his taxes, yeah, we don't have the tax lawyers that obviously the, sure. the president would have available to himself. And... Uh, this is what is needed, research. Yeah. And, and many people are pushing the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee to go faster and faster on this. You can't go faster and faster unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, and uh, you have to have uh, all of your facts in order and all of your ducks in a row. Also, it, it's taken a while to get organized, to get subcommittees uh, together, new chairs who have to bring in their own staffs and then decide on an agenda. But it's a good start. And I find it a good start on a, f a few fronts we're not going to see a whole lot of laws enacted in this two-year period. Right. But you also right. can keep bad legislation from passing, right. and you can use your clout to affect some changes. And that's what we've seen, I think, with a very effective negotiation that uh, Speaker Pelosi has done over this most recent uh, embarrassing shutdown and, and in its aftermath, although we're not out of the woods yet. 
Um, we've started to see some hearings done. Uh, bringing Have you in looked at any of them? Cabinet members. Yeah. And what, what were uh, you impressed? So what were you more impressed there, with? So there's one thing that I find uh, troubling more than anything else. The tendency here is to do hearings with the usual format. You know, watching the hearing with uh, Matt Whitaker, um, the faux attorney general. <laughs> um, and it was important to call him on the carpet. Good marks for that. Uh, and there were some uh, I exchanges that were memorable. But it, was, it had all those problems. And here's what I would do. I would say, we're not going to start with a bunch of opening statements. Maybe the chair and the ranking member. And then we're going to get a counsel who knows this stuff inside out to take the first 30 or 40 minutes wow. interrogating the witnesses and laying out a framework and doing it in a systematic way so that the important issues are there and they're explored in some right. depth. And then you can turn... So it's not as disjointed as it is now. You, you set the table. We don't set the table now. Right. Then you have members, not in five-minute segments, but maybe ten minutes, so that you have a little more of an opportunity to explore and get follow-up questions done. But frankly, what I would also do is, before I would hold a hearing that's an investigative hearing uh, or a serious oversight hearing, is I would get at least all of the members on the majority side together and talk about what those important issues are and divvy up the areas and let the members go back and do right. their own homework but make sure that you have in order people who can then follow up with what the previous uh, member had uh, had been discussing. I can't say to you Norm that I've always been a process person. Yeah. I like to get to the results yeah. the final. But you and some other folks that have worked with you, I think are making it more and more evident that unless you get involved in that process, unless that process is open and transparent, yeah. and, and unless you're doing your job in terms of oversight, for instance, you're not going to come up with anything really tangible at the end. You're yeah. just not. And it, it becomes much easier to, <coughs> excuse me, to turn it into, including the way the press covers it, a circus. It's, uh, okay, you've got this thrust and this parry and this right. charge, and then it becomes trivialized, and these should not be trivialized. Now, the other thing that I'm concerned about on that front is we've got a lot of committees and subcommittees, but we have more areas that need to be explored of miscreants and bad behavior and bad government and corruption than we have ever had before. The swamp. It is very hard to find a cabinet member in this administration who doesn't have real problems that need to be explored. It's hard to find a policy area where we don't have either incompetent people in charge or people who are protecting interests and not those of the public as a whole. And what I'm saying is you can't have every committee and subcommittee out there doing its own thing. You've got to focus and make sure that you divide up the responsibilities and then do them in the right way so that the larger impression that the public gets is you're doing your work and look at what they've been doing. Why are they not saying anything about this? Why do they allow it to happen? They're almost acting like kept people. Yeah. They're kept. In other words, we'll put all our eggs in one basket. The president will get us, look, I believe in loyalty. Don't get me wrong. But they are so obvious. The facts are laid across the record. The yeah. record is open. But they're not doing anything about it. Uh, Why? Because their party was in charge for three years or whatever it was? What I see on the Republican side, sadly, is a party that's gone from being a conservative party, of course, Good. but one focused on solving problems and what conservatism is supposed to represent, which is a passion for uh, institutions and process and making sure that things are done the right way. And that's become a party of theology. And the theology is around tax cuts and denying climate change and other things where facts don't No matter. science information. Yeah. But also, it's all about winning. And that's where, uh, you know, I would see a Republican Party that some years ago, uh, you could point to one 
key moment being Reince Priebus's famous autopsy about the Republican Party, it had a crossroads. One road to take is understanding that your core supporters are declining as a share of American voters and you will be a minority unless you change things. You have two ways to go. You can try to broaden your appeal to a larger group of voters, not just by changing rhetoric, but within the framework of your conservative philosophy, two years. change your policies. Right. Uh, or you double down on a base and you suppress votes on the other side and win that way. And that's what they've done. And it's reached a point where thinking about how you can work together to solve a problem, if we do that, then they may benefit. It's a serious business we're talking yeah. about. And In fact, it's yeah. dangerous business. Business, it's isn't it horribly dangerous for the country because we have enormous problems that we have not dealt with very effectively. Do you think that the president's uh, efforts at three or four times to say, hey, look, we, we, you know, the moral, moral equivalence, if you remember back in uh, Charlotte, I mean, every, everything, every, everybody has a right to say what they do, which they do, unless you're endangering someone else. That's a different story altogether. He's he's almost forcing people to not only take sides, but to be violent about it. Uh, I'm very serious about that. You know, watching uh, a portion of his rally down in El Paso, uh, it was chilling. I saw it. Uh, we had a, a cameraman assaulted, and it was encouraged by the president. No question uh, about it. just no doubt, and he's done that many, many times before. This is extended over, I think, in a host of other very troubling ways. His very close friend who managed the inaugural, which is now under serious right. investigation, Tom Barrick, was over in Saudi Arabia. And we uh, now Made have a statement. allegations that Barrick tried to use the in inaugural to advance his own business interests, which is one thing. But beyond that, a statement that basically said, uh, hey, who are we to judge the Saudis? We have a crown prince who overwhelming evidence tells us directly ordered the brutal torture and murder of a Washington Post journalist That's in right. Turkey. That's right. And one, we have a president who is violating the law by not issuing a report on the Khashoggi murder. Uh, and now at least there are stories that some Republicans are furious with him about that. The fury often means... Uh, Nothing. But, you know, I, the statement about the Charlottesville people, that there are very fine people on both sides, is going to be one of the most memorable phrases of his presidency. I'll never forget and it. And it will not be in a positive way. Yeah, moral equivalence. Yeah. That's, that's what we're facing. That's what we're facing on right now. What do we need to do, and how fast do we need to do it? So uh, I want to see Congress present a different public image as well. I want to see real debate and deliberation. I want a hearings. Public, yes. Biggest tax bill we've had in a long time, uh, December 2017. No hearings, no witnesses. And in the How Senate, do done behind closed doors. Right. And it is, I believe, the most reckless, dangerous piece of public policy enacted into law in 50 years. This is not just a, a ginormous tax cut. It's a tax cut done at a time of full employment and economic growth. The uh, federal government is supposed to be the counter-cyclical policymaker. Right. When you hit a difficult time, the states have balanced budget amendments. That means that they end up cutting spending and raising taxes at a bad time to do it. And it's the federal government that has to counterbalance that so that you can keep things from turning from recession to depression. Pro-cyclical policies give you a sugar high that then lead right. to a collapse, right. and then you've taken away all the weapons to get out of it. And that's what they did with this tax cut. And now you need to have not just the old standard hearings, you need to do roundtables, and you need to have debates on the floor that talk about the best tax policy, why this is bad, right. What can be done about it? Not just legislation. Not just legislating because we're not going to see as much of that. You need yeah. to pass bills through the House that show right. that you're capable of focusing on these problems. But where's your own dignity? How can you come to work every day and allow the executive branch of government to snuff you out, literally, and to not matter? It doesn't matter what you do. It's your allegiance to the president of the United States alone. How can you come to work every day and do that? 
You know, I've had uncomfortable conversations with Republican friends in the Senate who voted for that tax bill and knew that it was a mistake. And I've had Republican colleagues of yours in the House who privately rail against the insanity of this administration and then vote every single time to protect it. Don't say a word about kleptocracy or right. the horrible governance. And it's hard to understand. Uh, and I don't think it's just the job or just party discipline. I think it's also uh, the fear that if you step away from this, and it's not just a fear of a primary challenge, all the people who are a part of your circle will shun you. Um, there is a almost a cult-like element to the yes. way that people are behaving now. Right. And uh, it can't go on. And they're destroying themselves. You know, when I co-wrote the uh, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, and we really, for the first time, finally took on the Republican Party, uh, I had a ton of Republicans who were no longer serving call me up and say, thank you for trying to save our party, while Republicans in office were furious. <laughs> and others said, well, you're trying to destroy the Republican Party. We can't operate without two sane, problem-solving right. parties. Right. They're going to have different ideologies, but they both have to be there. And what so many of the Republicans in Congress are doing now is destroying their own party. It's going to lose its ability to function the way it should in a democracy such as ours. Well, Norm, you keep on writing about this. Um, I'm, I'm digging as best that I can. I want to be helpful to the process because I want to reinvigorate the institution I belong to, the House of Representatives. It's a key for the country and for the future and, and if we for don't, all these future generations. If we don't, yeah. then, you know, where will we be two years from now? Where will we be six years from now? Yeah, not in a good place. Not in a good place. Not in a good place. I want to thank you for coming on today. My pleasure. No breaks. We just went right through. Yeah. You are what you are, and I'm very proud of you. I want you to know that. Uh, well, I'm proud of you, too. You do, uh, you know... You represent what members are supposed to be doing here. You care about uh, social justice. You care about having this country work the way it's supposed to work. And you care about the institution you've been a part of for 22 years. So Norm, good for continue you. to do your work. Thank, thank you, you so much for being on our show. You thank you. Well, I want to thank you for watching this edition of To The Point. I want to thank my guest, Norm Ornstein, for joining us today. You, it was a treat. You've heard our thoughts. Now I would like to hear what you think about today's show. If you have any comments, concerns, or questions, stay tuned. Our address, our phone number, website address will appear in a moment. Thanks again for tuning in. And I'll see you next time on To The Point.